Hey, well, good morning. It's good to see you guys all, all bright and awake this morning. Jason, you're all bright and awake this morning. A little spring in your step. This has been an exciting week, I tell you. I was just really glad that uh, the Lord woke me up this morning. I was going to get a good solid uh, six hours and and I woke up an hour before my alarm went off, and I was like, seriously, really? <laughs> this, this is all I need? Uh, but anyway, uh, we had a big uh, three-day run livestock show for the last uh, few days, and, and it has been, uh, uh, that's always exciting. Uh, I, I figured out, you know, we, we told you the story a few weeks ago about the uh, uh, uncooperative uh, hogs. Uh, you know, we loaded them Thursday in the daylight, and they were just so cooperative. And then we came back Saturday night to load them again, and they wouldn't load. And I figured out they're daytime hogs. They're not nighttime hogs. No nightlife for those guys at all. They just don't function in the dark. So uh, we won't be doing that anymore. Uh, we've come to an agreement that we only operate in daylight hours. So we, we've, we've reached that point. I want to say good morning to all those that are watching the podcast or watching the uh, on YouTube and listening to the podcast. Uh, we have had a lot of great reviews over the past few weeks and, and a lot of thank yous, especially during vacation season. A lot of folks traveling around. Uh, that has been a really neat uh, addition to... Um, uh, what we're able to accomplish here at Living Faith. Well, we've come to the conclusion of our series on fear. Uh, we've been talking about this for uh, six weeks uh, with a couple of weeks taken out, but we've been looking at how we uh, really get control of fear because fear is one of those things that Jesus told us not to do. Of all the good things that he told us to do and all the things that he taught us, one of the things, and there were, we're going to over the period of time talk about five big things that Jesus told us that we needed to really avoid in our life, one of the things that he told us over and over and over again is to not be afraid. Not be afraid. And, and, and as humans, it is just absolutely hard to do because we all have things that we are afraid of. And some folks are extremely uh, fearful of things. And, and for some reason, my daughter, Michaela, has now become afraid of bugs. And I'm like, you've been living on the farm for 12 years. How in the world have you now just become afraid of spiders? Uh, and she just wasn't aware, I don't think, of some of the dangers that was around her. And I, I made the mistake, I think, of pointing out a, uh, a brown recluse to her because those things are everywhere, and, and especially in barns and farms and boxes and all these different places. And, and so now she's developed that fear of bugs that are around us. Well, you know, there's all kinds of dangers that are around us. That's just the truth. It's the truth of the world that we live in. We, we live in a world of danger. We live in a world that there's all kinds of things around every corner. But, but for those who are in Christ, for those who love Jesus, for those who are born again, for those who are his followers, we don't have to live a life uh, of, of fear. Um, and, and so over these weeks, we've talked about this, and, and we've talked about how uh, we can uh, overcome uh, this, uh, these fears that we have. Today, we're going to bring the series to a close and, and realizing that someday we'll probably come back to this because there's a lot of specific fears uh, that we encounter on a daily basis that I haven't addressed. And I didn't want to spend uh, 25 weeks uh, going over uh, all the different types of fears. But, but uh, we picked up some of the ones that are, that are most uh, uh, important and, and some of the ones that most people seem to experience. But today, we're going to close our series by looking at... A healthy fear. The one fear that we should experience, uh, particularly as Christian people. And that is the fear of God. Now hold on to that thought because we're going to get there because uh, uh, when we get to that point, uh, you'll understand it a little, bit, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more. You know, sometimes I start feeling younger uh, than I really am. Yesterday we were uh, <laughs> at the hog show and, and Michaela, we had left the stick that she uses to, to guide the hogs in the ring. We had left it in the truck and the truck was parked on the other side of the parking lot at Western on the other side of the whole thing and it was a long way away and, and so I went in and it was we, were, we show two species so she, Kayla's in the ring with, with goat or the sheep and, and, and then all of a sudden I look over and I realize that her class is up next in the hogs so I got to 
go get the hog and get it in the makeup arena, and she's just going to come out of the sheep ring and come around and just go right in with the hog. So I've got to have everything ready. And, and I go out, and, and, I, and Kelsey Elijah is, is pinned with us. And so I grabbed her green whip uh, for the hog, and I, and I just grabbed it, and I start guiding the hog up. And what I don't realize is that on the other pin next to us, across from us, is this little girl. And she's standing there next to her mom, and she's looking at her mom going, that man just stole my whip. <laughs> And, and the mama's like, are you sure that's your whip? And she said, yes, mama, he took my whip. And, and I'm driving this pig up through there. And so this mama comes up there, and she's all kind of humble. And she's like, sir, I believe you picked up uh, maybe my daughter's whip. And I said, oh, this is yours? I'm sorry, I thought it was Kelsey's. And I handed her. And so then I grab another one, and she's like, that's her pole too. And I'm like, and she's got to use it. And I'm like, oh, my God. So now I'm starting to feel younger <laughs> than I am. And I go into a sprint, and I ran out of the barn and across the parking lot. And I got out, and I grabbed the stick out of the back of the truck and I ran all the way back in and I handed it to Michaela and then I realized that I'm incapable of running <laughs> all right and all of a sudden I realized that I'm not 25 and I am way overweight and I go sit down and Sandy looks at me and she says are you going to die <laughs> and I said I feel okay I'm a little out of breath I, I ran a little bit far she said no you don't understand what you look like <laughs> you look like you're about to die and I said I'll be <sighs> Okay, it's no problem. Okay, sometimes we think we're younger than we are. Sometimes we think that we're thinner than I really am. Uh, and here's the thing: other people's perspective of you is often different than what it really is. Okay, I still feel 16. Okay, and and, and then I realize sometimes I, I'm thinking, why can't? I can't, why can't I wear an extra large shirt? Why does it have to be 2X? Because I feel like it should be a medium, okay? Now, see, Jess is probably still wearing small, okay? But, but, I, but here I am in this, in this bowling shirt that you could probably make a tent out of for most children, okay? I think I'm thinner than I really am. My perspective of myself is different than it, what it uh, really is. That's what a lot of people do with God. They, they have a perspective of God that is different than what he really is. Some people equate God with a building. So they say, well, let's go to church. So when you come to church and you come into this room, you somehow then feel as if you are growing closer to the presence of God, that somehow God dwells in this room, in this room alone, and so that if you come here, then you've come closer to him. You see, that's some people's perspective of God. And, and that's really kind of a false perspective. And, that, and that's what I want to kind of dig into. Because, because here's the thing. When we do this, we like to think that God, this is why we like to think that, okay? And, and if you're here this morning and that's kind of been your perspective, then hang on with me. Just stay with me because this is what we like to do. We like to think that God is here because if he's here, then when we leave here... <laughs> He's not where we are, okay? And then we can do a few things that he won't know about, right? We can do some things that he's not going to be concerned about, that he's not going to see. Because if we can keep God in a box, if we can keep God somewhere else rather than where we are, then we don't have to worry about what we're doing so much. You see, we equate the presence of God with a place. We, we, like, to keep, uh, we like to keep our God sometimes in a box. And this is why we like to keep him in a box. If we can keep our God in a box, then we can control him. You see, because God, this world is crazy, right? And, and the last thing that we need is an out-of-control God. Okay, so we need God in a box so that we can control him. And if we can control him, then he'll be there when we need him. We take him out of his box when we need him. Okay, if life is going good and it's fun and everything's happening and everything's rolling right, then we just leave him in the box, okay? Or we won't go where we think he is. And we can just live life and we don't have to worry about it. But when we take him out of the box, then we need him. And, and, and this is what we want. There's a lot of folks out there that want a God that they can manage. They want a God that they can manage, a God that they can control, a God that they can predict. It's safer that way. It's safer that way. I mean, goodness, <laughs> We can't have an out-of-control God. We need a God that we can control, right? So when we call, he comes. All right? When we're in need, we call out to him, he comes. <laughs> like a cat. All right? We pet him, he purrs. Okay? 
if we could just keep God in his place. I think that that's what Peter and James and John were trying to do. They were trying to keep God in their little box. And so Jesus comes on the scene, and, and he recruits them to follow him. And, and, and the whole time that, that God in the flesh is walking and talking with these guys, they're trying to keep him in their box. They're trying to package him the way that they think this should go. And they're trying to figure this whole thing out. And, and they're trying to keep him in this controlled setting, in this controlled idea. And, 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 and because of that, <laughs> well, Jesus, he had to take them on a, a little box-blowing expedition. Turn your Bibles if you have them, or log on you version, or get on the on your on your iPhone, iPad. I don't care. It'd be it'd be great. Just take a break from Candy Crush and look at at Matthew chapter seventeen, verse one, uh, because Matthew's perspective of this uh, this this little trip uh, that Jesus took uh, is it, is just fascinating. It says after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Wow. Have you ever studied the transfiguration? Hmm. The high points of Scripture, the high points of Scripture seem to occur on the high points of earth. Some of the highest places of Scripture, some of those places and those moments that stick out in our mind seem to occur on the high places uh, in the Holy Land. Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Christ redeemed all of humanity on a hill called Calvary. And Jesus took his disciples up to a high mountain. Most scholars believe, because the mountain's not named, that it was Mount Hermon. I pulled a picture up of Mount Hermon, just a, not a really good one, but you can just kind of see. This is one of the highest places there in Israel. And if you could just kind of look into the horizon, you see the snow peaks. Uh, the snow is still there because it's one of those high places. It's, it's in the eight, 9,000 foot range, and, and it's a really high place. And so most, most scholars believe that this is where uh, this transfiguration occurred. It was a very tall mountain. You see, Jesus took his closest disciples up there to get them away from crowds, to get them away from controversies, to get them to, those pl to a place where he could pray, where they could pray and where they could spend some time alone with each other. And, and, and here's the thing. He's just a few months away from the cross. He's getting closer to the cross and it's beginning to weigh on his mind. And Jesus himself needed this time. He needed this moment. But he wanted to share it with Peter and James and John for a reason. So wonder why he took them up there. Wonder why he took them up there. Wonder why he wanted them to see. He wanted his followers to see where he got his strength. He wanted his followers to know where his power came from. At some point in their prayer time, at some point in their time on this mountain, because you can tell, that's a big hill, okay? That's a tall, that's a tall walk. That just, you don't just run up there and run back down. This was a journey. This was a journey. This was a hike, okay? So they were up there, and at some point in time together, while they were there and while they were praying, Jesus erupts <laughs> into this powerful light. And there's Peter, James, and John going, wow, <laughs> okay? Wow, they've never seen this before. No other person has ever seen this. 
Okay, no one has ever seen this. All of a sudden, Jesus in his purest form, Jesus for who he really is, begins to appear to these three disciples. Wow. I mean, Jesus for all his power and all his glory, he erupts into light. And, and, and this is just amazing. We, we believe that Mark shares for us Peter's perspective of this. And he said that his, his clothes shimmered and glistened. It was a powerful moment. It was something that, that stayed with them and, and for the rest of their lives. This radiance was not the work of a laundry. <laughs> okay? This radiance was, was the presence of God. Scripture always equates God with light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. So this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. And so Peter, James, and John are on this mountain of transfiguration and they see this happen and, and it's an amazing thing. And they've never seen Jesus in this form. But Jesus was just getting warmed up because suddenly after they see this radiant light, all of a sudden two other people show up and they recognize them. Okay, they recognize Moses and they recognize Elijah. And it's like, wow. Okay, these guys were Jews, okay? So this is like Washington and Lincoln to us, okay? These are their heroes of the faith. So all of a sudden, they're standing there on this mountain. They see Jesus as they've never seen him before. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah shows up. They recognize them. And, and, and this is, can you imagine just be, being there and experiencing this? I mean, this, this moment kind of had to take them back to the moment they were on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> it's like, what kind of guy is this? What kind of man is this? And then Peter. Love him, love him, love him. <laughs> At this point, Peter enters into the scene. <laughs> okay, this, this massive, powerful moment. And, and, and Peter kind of inserts his foot in his mouth as he does so eloquently. Wow. <laughs> wow, Jesus, Elijah, Moses. It seems that you all know each other. No need for a formal introduction here. <laughs> it's, it's good that we're all here. Uh, I tell you what, this, uh, this kind of moment calls for a building program. <laughs> I think I'll be the chairman of the committee, and if you don't mind, I'll build three tabernacles for all three of you. Now, that idea is so off base. It's so off, off the mark that, that God doesn't even allow him to finish his statement. Okay? It does, God doesn't even allow Peter to get this completely. It says, while he was still speaking, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son. This is my son, whom I love. And with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So why the moment? Why Elijah? Why Moses? You see, Peter was trying to put Jesus in the same category. He was trying to put Jesus in the same category. Another hero. Hey, wow, you're all here. <laughs> it's awesome. Moses is here, and, and Elijah's here, and Jesus is here. Because see, because see, it's, 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 they're, they're these heroes. I mean, this is, this is, this is it. I mean, when you, when you look at this, it's, uh, the, these guys that, uh, that brought us the law. Okay? The giver of the law is Moses. The prince of the prophets is Elijah. And here they are. But God says, no. He cut him off in mid-sentence and says, this. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You need to listen to him. Beloved means priceless. Priceless and unique. Peter. Peter, I need you to see for your own eyes that yes, Moses, yes, Elijah, but no, it is only through Jesus. It is only Him. He is the one, and you need to listen to Him. There is no other like Christ. He stopped him in mid-sentence to say, there is no other like Christ. Not Moses, not Elijah, not Peter, not Buddha, not Muhammad. There is no other except Christ. Okay? No other. No one comes to the Father except through Him and Him alone. And He made His point very clear. The Father declared Him the beloved Son. You see, Peter was missing it 
He was missing it. He was trying to put his God in a box. Well, when the voice came, that was it. <laughs> there was no more talking. They were, they were quiet at that point. No more talk of building programs and, and tabernacles and tents. They saw at that point something that no other person has ever seen. The transfigured Christ. The transfigured Christ. And look at their reaction. <laughs> After the voice, listen to their reaction and see it. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. That was their reaction to the realization of what they were standing. That, my friends, was the fear of the Lord. It was the fear of the Lord. We've talked about these fears that are unhealthy, and we've talked about uh, those, but this fear is healthy. And understand this, there is nothing wrong. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with a healthy fear of God. As a matter of fact, the crazy thing would be is to not be afraid of God at all. <laughs> that would be crazy. The crazy thing would be not to be afraid of God at all. Because here, here it is. When God is fully revealed to us, when God is like he was there, when, when all of a sudden he was fully revealed to Peter and James and John, when God is fully revealed to us, we get it. <laughs> we get it. And when we get it, then we experience the conversion of our fear. We experience the conversion of our fear because fear of the Lord is when we finally come to the conclusion that we are not God. That we are not God. And see, that's been the problem from the beginning. When Satan whispered to Eve, if you eat the fruit, Eve, you will be like God. And we had that desire and so Peter, James, and John are thinking, you know, it's, it's Moses, and there's Jesus, and there's Elijah, and there's just three of us, and he brought us up here, and so who knows what's going to happen, and this could be really cool, so we're just going to build some places and hang out. And God said, no, you don't get it. It's him, and him alone. And then they realized that they're not God, and that he is. When we come to that conclusion and that realization, we realize that we are not God. So my question for you this morning, and as we conclude this series, and as we wrap this all up, how long has it been since you have experienced that kind of fear? How long has it been since you have experienced that kind of fear? Because we, too, need to know the transfigured Christ. We need to know Him. You see, as they were coming down the mountain, I'm sure they were kind of skipping along thinking, this is really cool. And Jesus said, you don't need to talk about this until after I've been raised from the dead. They didn't get that either. Okay? But see, this is after he was raised from the dead because he did die on the cross. He was in the tomb three days. He did ri raise from the dead. And after he went ascended into heaven, then they're thinking about going, you remember when we were on that mountain? Remember when we saw who he was? That's pretty cool. And we need to tell people about it because he told us we could now. And so we have it. And they told us about it. <laughs> it's awesome. When Christ is great, when Christ is great, our fears are reduced. Our fears are reduced. A big God gives us big courage because he can show up in a big way. And when that happens, it's awesome. It's awesome. And see, Jesus knew. <laughs> he knew where they were. Jesus saw that Peter, James, and John were trying to put him in a box. So he took them up the mountain because he knew what was coming in their future. He could see Peter standing next to a fire going, I don't know who he is, I don't know who he is, I don't know anything about. He knew that was coming, okay? He, he saw Nero. He saw the persecution that would befall them. He, he saw the things that they were going to do. He saw them standing before the Sanhedrin being, being, being chastised, saying, you don't need to preach about this, Jesus. And, and he knew that they needed to see him that way because that was going to be the image. When they're standing there before men going, you don't need to talk about Jesus, and they're seeing that glowing God on top of the Mount Hermon going, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> you haven't seen what I've seen, and I know who he is. Okay? It gave them power and courage. Jesus knew that they needed it. He knew that they needed it, so he let them see, and he let them tell us about it. Do you know 
the transfigured Christ? Do you know the transfigured Christ? A box-sized God won't work. <laughs> a box-sized God won't work. When you do, <laughs> all of your fears will melt away. C.S. Lewis in his book, Prince Caspian, gives us the account of Lucy seeing Aslan for the first time in many years. To her, he has changed a lot since their last encounter. And she said, Aslan, you're bigger. He said, that is because you are older, little one. Not because you are. I am not. Every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And so it is with Jesus. The longer that we live in Him, the greater He becomes in us. The longer we live in Him, the greater we, He becomes in us. God doesn't change. <laughs> we do. He's an everlasting God. He's an unchanging God. He's the same yesterday, today, and He will be tomorrow. He's an unchanging God, but we are the ones who change. We see more of Him. We see the dimensions, the aspects, and the characteristics that we never saw before. We see it, and our reaction will be the same as Peter and James and John. We will fall on our faces in reverence and in fear. I've seen it. I've seen God show up in big ways in people's lives. I've seen God show up in big ways in my life. And when it does, it makes you fall on your face. Things that you think you can control and all of a sudden it's out of your control and then God takes over and says, you just step back and watch. And then it's amazing to see it happen. It's a powerful thing. <laughs> and then we fall on our face in reverence and in fear. But as we fall on our faces in fear, as we fall on our faces prostrate in, re in reverence to God, He does the same for you and the same for me that He did for Peter, James, and John. Because look, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and He touched them. And He said, Get up and don't be afraid. Get up and don't be afraid. Fear of God is a healthy fear, but still, in that moment of reverence, in that moment of, of being face down before God, He reaches out and He touches us and He says, Do not be afraid. Do not fear. And when they looked up, they saw nobody but Jesus. I bet they were skipping when they came down that mountain. <laughs> What's your perception of Jesus? What is your perception of Jesus? Is he pocket-sized? Is he on a shelf? Does he hang on a wall in a picture in a room in your house? A good-looking red-headed Irishman? <laughs> okay? One of those pictures? Is that your Jesus? Okay? Let me challenge you. Let him be real in your life. Let him be real in your life. Maybe you've, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and maybe you just, you, you know that he died on the cross, you believe that, you get that. You know that he was buried, you believe that he raised, that was raised again. But you've just kind of held back and just tried to put him in a box. Call on him when you need him, when things are going bad. Let me challenge you. Let him be real in your life. Let him be real in your life. Let him guide you. Let him lead you. Those fears, those problems, those things that you're hanging on to, those things that you can't face, those, those scenarios that you roll over and over and over in your head over and over and over again, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. One of the greatest fears that I ever had was losing my job. It eat me alive day and night. Day and night for years. Over and over and over in my head. It played over and over and over in my head like a movie. What would happen if I lost my job? 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 One day I sat in a site-based council meeting in the library of Ohio County High School. 
and that council sat there in front of me and they voted to terminate my position and I lost my job. My greatest fear was realized. My greatest fear was real. I, I had worried about that for years. Laid awake at night. It was my greatest fear that I would lose my job. I stood up <laughs> and I walked out of that library and I walked out in the back parking lot of that school. Left my daughter crying in the classroom because her daddy was not going to be her ag advisor anymore. I walked out in the parking lot and I said, God, I, I've worried about this for years. And now it's happened. <laughs> and, and I don't know what to do. And, and you're just going to have to show up. Because I'm, I'm tapped out. Because my worry didn't stop it. My fear didn't keep it from happening. I said, it's yours. I'll do whatever I need to do. And I walked away. And let me tell you, <laughs> fire came from the sky. Tornadoes fell out of the, of, the, of the sky that day in Ohio County, all over the state of Kentucky. Storms and wind and tornadoes. And I'm praying, God, I don't want anybody to get hurt. Nobody's property was damaged. Nobody got hurt. But he showed up in a powerful way. I got down on my knees that night and I said, God, if there's any way, I do not want to go to school tomorrow. I don't want to face my kids. I don't want this to happen. The next morning, the one call came in. There's no school in Ohio County this morning. I'm going, oh boy. <laughs> and I just sat down in a chair for two days. And two months later, I got my job back. And I didn't do anything. And God said, don't fear. Don't fear. I got this. I'll do it in my way and in my time. And let me tell you something. This is, this is the truth. If any man tries to get in your way while you're doing his will, it won't work for him. Because my God is bigger. My God is greater. He is that transfigured Christ on the, on the hill of Mount Hermon who glowed. <laughs> will say to that person, it's not good for you. Any person who will stand in the way of what God's will is will be removed from that path. Taken out. I've seen it happen. I've watched it happen. And you know what? I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> I'm not afraid anymore. Because I've seen him. I've seen him show up. I've seen it happen. It's happened in my life and it's happened in yours. My greatest fears... My greatest fears. When I sat next to the hospital bed when Michaela was, was to be born that day and the nurse looked at me and said, heart rate is dropping, oxygen levels are dropping, we don't, we need the doctor. And I was thinking, I need God. And I walked out in the hallway and I said, I need, I need help. And I, the only prayer line that I had that I could call was the campers on mission. And I called Jerry Schistler, I called Ann Schistler. And I said, I need you to pray for this. And five hours later, <laughs> I delivered Michaela healthy and bouncing. Wow. I've seen those moments. I've had those moments when that fear just collapses around you and you just want to be afraid and Satan wants to just get in your head. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And God has shown up in big, big ways because he's a big God. Is he that big in your life? If he's not... <laughs> Let him be. Let him be. Let him be that big in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. <laughs> you are a big God. We try to keep you in a box. We try to put you on a shelf. We try to keep you in a building. And you just want to be the Lord of our lives. <laughs> you want to be there you want to be there just to show us. I'm so thankful that you took Peter and James and John up on that mountain. And I'm so thankful that you showed them who you really are. So when times got tough, they didn't have to run and hide. They could stand boldly and proclaim that you're king. I thank you for how you've shown up in my life. How you've taken some of my worst fears. How you've taken some of the things that I fear the most. And then you've stepped into the middle of that moment and said, hm, I got this. I got this. Wow. 
about that maybe there's someone here this morning that you need to step into their life. They're playing that, that, that video over and over in their mind. That same thought is going over and over in their mind. That's that, that constant worry, that constant fear, that constant thing that's just nagging at them. You just want to take that from them, Father. You, they, they, they need to see the transfigured Christ. They need to see the powerful God that you are. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. Father, I just pray that you just have your way in our hearts this morning. Whatever decisions we need to make, how we need to draw closer to you, that we might look at you and say, wow, you're, you're so much bigger <laughs> than I remembered you. You haven't changed. It will be us that have changed. Change us, Father. Mold us and shape us into your likeness, putting our full trust and our faith in you. And maybe there's someone here this morning that their life is just it's dragging them down and they've never put their trust in you the first time. They came this morning looking for a big God. Help them to leave here today having found you. I pray, Father, that you would guide us in this time of invitation, that we would reflect and we would respond in the way you would have us. We pray it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.